Well, thank you everyone uh, for having us this evening. We actually brought some of our team members with us, um, some of us that help us lead our efforts. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about an overview of TriHealth, um, where we serve in this community, and then Emily's going to talk a little bit about the, the revenue cycle, with kind of what that means. Uh, but first, a little bit about myself. This is a, a group that's near and dear to my heart. My family was impacted by prostate cancer about 25 years ago. So uh, kind of cool to be here with you guys. So thanks for having me. Um, I'm also a social worker by background. Um, I used to work, um, before I worked at TriHealth, uh, for a small community hospital called Cincinnati Children's. You guys may have heard of that. <laughs> 18,000 employees. Yes, yeah, right. <laughs> Um, I worked there for about 10 years, and I, I did a couple of roles in social work, mental health. Um, my last role there was a manager of patient experience, and, and then three years ago I came to TriHealth uh, to be the executive in charge of patient experience. And one of the really cool things about my job as the executive in charge of patient experience is that I have 13,000 other people to rely on to also be the directors of patient experience. Um, and, I'll, and I'll talk a little bit about what that means. Uh, but first, if you guys don't mind, I wanted to share a little bit about TriHealth. Um, well, here's our agenda. So we'll do an introduction. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about patient advocacy, really what that means um, at TriHealth, and then Emily's going to go over the, uh, the billing process. Um, so first and foremost, we are a, a large continuum of care. We are a system. We're probably the largest system in all of Cincinnati. Um, serving uh, greater Southwest Ohio and if I would have been here about six seven years ago we would have been a system between Good Samaritan Hospital and Bethesda North Hospital but we've grown tremendously in the last eight years uh, we have six hospitals within our system now um, so there we have our flagship hospitals Good Sam Bethesda North uh, we also have Evendale Hospital um, if anybody's familiar with it really right down the road from here um, we also have a, a hospital in Butler County uh, between Hamilton and Westchester. It's our Bethesda Butler campus. Um, if anybody's familiar with Oxford, Ohio, we have McCullough Hyde uh, within our system now. And then we also have the TriHealth Rehab Hospital. Uh, so those are our kind of our large acute care hospitals. But we also have 140 other sites of care that we're responsible with. Uh, we have over, I think we're up to now 700 plus uh, physicians in our system and we have now I think we're over 13,000 uh, employees whom we call team members um, and then uh, a 1. billion, 1.8 billion dollar operation so um, I say all of that to say we are, we're not just uh, two hospitals anymore we're really a vast system of care and we exist really to uh, our mission is to serve the community uh, to really s to improve the health of the people we serve and our vision, our vision is to be the place where people want to work, physicians want to practice, and, but most importantly, where our community wants to receive care. So that's really why we're here. Uh, we're a very service-oriented organization. Uh, you will hear that a lot from both Emily and myself, um, that we really are here to serve. And that's, that's, that's what we want to talk about tonight, how we serve in that capacity. Uh, you could see, I don't know if you can all see the, uh, the map here, but that's really... All of our locations spread out across all of Southwest Ohio. Um, the stars are our hospitals and then the dots are each of our uh, ambulatory sites and physician practices. So you can really see a kind of massive, expansive health system across this region. So that's TriHealth. Um, a little bit about my role at TriHealth. Um, I mentioned I'm the director of patient experience, probably wondering a little bit about what that means. I oversee what we call the Office of Patient Experience, or I'm sorry, the Office of Patient Engagement. And we're really the support department uh, to help TriHealth um, transform the way we serve patients and uh, to really be evolved to a patient and family centered care. Uh, healthcare has gotten really complicated over the years. <laughs> And what we try to do is really simplify that and, and really make it about the patient. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about our transformation journey after I share about what our department does. Um, but healthcare is, a, is a evolving. The way we have finance and reimburse healthcare, but also the healthcare delivery models. And so I'll share a little bit about our journey towards improving that. But at the center of it is really to improve the experience of our patients and their families. And that's what my department really helps support TriHealth do. So 
the four functions within the Office of Patient Engagement. Uh, first and foremost is uh, what we call patient advocacy. This is the Department of Patient Relations, um, and we, are, we exist to help our patients, their family members, and our community uh, be connected to the resources within TriHealth and within the community. Uh, so that's the patient advocacy piece. If you are a patient in, within TriHealth and you have a concern or question, uh, my team in patient relations helps uh, address any concerns, helps address any uh, questions you might have. If you're having any gaps in care, uh, we're here to make sure that quickly gets addressed. Um, so the, the complaint management, the grievance management, patient advocacy, um, service recovery is what, what we call um, kind of addressing gaps in service or communication. So that team is, is, exists to really serve patients in that capacity. Uh, we also measure the voice of our patients. So how many of you guys have ever received a, what we call a patient satisfaction survey? Awesome. Well, thank you for filling that out and completing that. <laughs> so uh, part of my team also takes in all the data, all the, uh, the things that our patients tell us uh, through surveys, through focus groups, through complaints, through, through compliments, all of that sort of data, and we distill down what our patients are saying about the care they're receiving. And so uh, there's, those are opportunities to recognize and reward departments or people that really go above and beyond for our patients um, and also to address where we need to improve so looking at themes and where we need to improve patient experience so that team really wraps their arms around the data and the voice of our customers then we also have uh, what we call guest services and hospitality so these are the folks that greet you when you walk into one of our hospitals or ambulatory sites um, really managing the, the key entry points to make sure uh, how many of you guys have been to Good Samaritan Hospital before? Anyone? Okay. How many of you have been lost within Good Samaritan Hospital? Oh yes, me too. Um, so that team helps greet you or take you where you need to go. We have complicated buildings and guest service is kind of that first impression, first touch point to make sure uh, we get you where you need to go. And if you have any uh, non-clinical needs, we're, we're there to make sure that we can meet those, um, meet those for you and connect you to the community as well. So then, we also have volunteer services. And so this is actually the largest department in all of TriHealth uh, because we have anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 volunteers in any given year. Um, and so I don't know a department within TriHealth that has more people than that. Um, all of volunteer services employees are unpaid. They give their time, they donate their time to us. So they pitch in and really help out where they're needed most. Um, this this could be in the form of taking lost guests where they need to go. Um, it could be cuddling with babies in the NICU, which sounds um, uh, fun. Um, it could be anything. But what we're trying to do is really change the way that we partner with volunteers. We don't want volunteers in the back of the house stocking things and folding things. We really want them touching patients and being with patients. And so that's what that team is there to do. So really help patients throughout the continuum of care. So in a nutshell, that's really the Office of Patient Engagement, um, where you may have touch points for the most part um, is either with patient advocacy and then making sure that your voice is heard through, through the measurement team. I wanna share a little bit about um, our journey. So I mentioned healthcare has changed a lot. And healthcare is, is really rapidly changing. We're moving from what we call a fee for service. So paying for something every time you go to, to um, receive care to more of a value, uh, a value-based healthcare delivery model and financing model. So what's at the center of that are consumers. And so we have to make sure that we're adding value to your experience, that, we're, we're, that we are improving your health. Um, so we're, we're moving from t just taking care of people that are sick to actually improving health. And so that's called population health. And so, um, I'll touch a little bit about on that, but first and foremost, our journey, we started this transformation journey about three years ago. And it really started first and foremost with, um, how are we gonna get to population health? And so how are we gonna back ourselves into that? Um, so it started with really engaging our workforce to make sure 13,000 people are engaged in their work, to make sure they, they feel like the work that they do is purposeful, worthwhile work. 
uh, because who wants to come to a, a hospital or a health system where somebody's just not happy in their job? Nobody. Um, so that's where we started, to really transform TriHealth to be uh, a, a population health enterprise. So we've been on this journey, really, the TriHealth way of leading um, and really engaging uh, TriHealth to be the great, a great place to work. Then the next phase in our journey was, um, was my favorite part, which in involves the TriHealth way of serving. So we're, we're being, being very purposeful about the way we interact with patients, the way we engage you in your care. Um, and that is called the TriHealth Signature Experience. And that's something that uh, we will continue to do forever because that's the mission of TriHealth is to, is to really serve our community. And then we've recently kicked off um, the third phase of the work, which is around really imp improving clinical outcomes and becoming a population health enterprise and really uh, becoming the, the safest, most reliable place to receive care. Uh, so reducing variation in, in clinical care delivery at the same time as making TriHealth the safest uh, place to come and receive care. Um, so that's really in a nutshell what we've been doing over the last three years and for the, the folks that work here at, at TriHealth, um, something at TriHealth is changing every day um, and, and we're doing that to really meet the needs of our community. So that is, that's my overview of TriHealth. I don't think I have anything else. Um, I can take, I'll take questions at the end once Emily wraps up. Yeah. So does anybody have any questions about TriHealth, patient advocacy? Well, yes, sir. Yeah, you mentioned something about, about uh, moving from a fee-for-service model yes. to a, I guess, maybe more of a European model where, uh, I don't know how it works here, I know how it works in Europe, where uh -huh. hospitals are given a certain budget. Yes. And you've got to live with that budget, right? That's it. So in a nutshell, we're moving from fee-for-service to more of a value-based payment model where we will be reimbursed for uh, improving clinical outcomes uh, as well as improving your experience uh, and a number of other things but it basically comes down to improving clinical outcomes um, not harming you in your care um, and and really engaging you in your experience so that's really kind of where the na our nation's healthcare delivery model is evolving to the knock on fee for service has been it's been part of the cult for the rising cost of health care. Sure. And how are you addressing, well, I don't know if that you or your, your colleague is going to be addressing that issue. But, uh, that Emily, will, Emily may touch on that. Um, okay. If not, we'll come back to it and address it at the end. Right, I think that's a good question. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, my wife and I just went through an experience. Uh, we've been trial people forever. And we've had AFib and we've had ambulance trips up and trial. Everything's been just wonderful. But now she's come down with something undiagnosed so far and she has a terrible pain in her neck. It looks at the floor of her feet. She's got a cane. She's a fall risk. And so what do we do? Um, we had different consultations and we decided we needed a neurologist. Mm -hmm. So I call, I, I called a buddy of mine, a mm -hmm. doctor. Who do you recommend? And she talked to her family practitioner. Who do you recommend? They recommended uh, River Hills Neurology, which is not in your system. Right. So there's two good referrals. We went down there. Wonderful. And he said, Well, we need a CAT scan of your brain and your neck, which we're done today, and an EMG. For you folks know what EMG is a test for nerve, pinched nerve. They get a needle in it. <coughs> And he said, well, you can go downstairs to Christ. They put her in the building down there in Norwood. Mm -hmm. Or you go to try I said, well, we're kind of a try people. It ends up, uh, I don't know exactly why, but the uh, tests were just done yesterday at Christ Hospital out here. Mm -hmm. We thought that's better running down in Norwood. Well, then uh, we needed this EMG. And we didn't get a lot of guidance from the people down there, I don't think. So we called. I think I called my family practitioner for the EMG. Give me two doctors' names, called this number. I called the number, and lo and behold, it's Mercy over on Five Mile. I said, what? So then, and we're in the building down on Gavin Road, where everything really handy. So I went to the scheduling lady down there. I said, well, don't you have EMGs? Sure. You take care of that. 
don't you have a neurologist? Oh yeah, we got a neurologist. And I call a doctor friend of mine, John Tui, you may know the name, the retired brain surgeon. He said there's a somebody that's a, a good Sam, a, uro, or a, a neurologist. So my question is, mm -hmm. why do they refer us outside the system? And then we go through all this complication when we put it inside the system. But to me, it's routine testing, unless I'm missing something. And maybe you don't want to address something like that, but it's been very, very frustrating. Wow. When you say patient experience, I didn't yeah. know where to go yeah. to ask for this. I didn't know where to go, so I went to the doctors. And then, it so sort of sounds like we left it up to you to coordinate the care instead of us coordinating the Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know why they referred you out of the system. I apologize they did that. Um, Two different doctors. Yeah. I, and they I, were tri they were tri health doctors. Yes, absolutely. I, I, don't, I don't know why. They, so one of our one of our strategic priorities is to really keep patients within the system. Sure. So I'm not sure why why that occurred. I'd be happy to follow up more um, on that. But that's unfortunate. I'm sorry that happened. I can, yeah, answer, I can answer your question. Yeah. Yes, I can answer your question. There's a dearth of neurologists in town. Mm -hmm. As simple as that. Yeah. You've got neurologists who want to retire that are staying in practice because they can't find replacements. Yeah, that's actually a very good point. Actually, Emily and I were part of a meeting earlier with the uh, service line director of neurosciences talking about um, there's a gap in this community with the, the number of uh, neurologists and neurosurgeons. Um, so there aren't a ton of them. You're absolutely right. Anybody else have any questions? Oh, real quick. Yes, sir. Just pertaining to that. Uh, when I was diagnosed with my uh, prostate cancer, uh, my urologist at the time was Emmett O'Neill, who passed away now. And so his, the people he was working with was at uh, Chris Sam, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Shahada, and uh, my surgeon at the time was uh, Dr. Eric Kuhn. Because he'd done the surgery, <coughs> and I've done the uh, the chemotherapy, uh, most of the chemotherapy at uh, at Good Sam. But I mean, I started getting these bills that was just outrageous. I mean, totally outrageous. And so uh, I went to one of my chemotherapy uh, sessions, and I told the nurse, I said, "Hey, look, uh, I'm gonna have to file bankruptcy. I can't keep coming back here. I mean." I, you know, I have Medicare and uh, AARP United Healthcare. So I just said, well, Mrs. Scott, you went on network. <coughs> I said, ma'am, I didn't know that. My doctor told me I had prostate cancer. They told me what to do. I just followed what you all asked me to do, and then you give me this kind of bill. And I said, I'm going to have to file bankruptcy. And I never forget the nurse, uh, nurse page. She said, Mrs. Scott, she said, don't do anything until you talk to uh, the guy who's in charge of the finances, I never forget his name, was CJ. She said he's in the building, this uh, is Sam, and he came upstairs, excuse me, I gave him information stuff. He said, don't file bankruptcy, he said, don't worry about no bills, anything. He said, wait until you hear from me. It's gonna take me about six weeks. And wait till you hear from me. The dog told that guy, that he done, he, I don't know if they call the hospital eating it up or, or whatever, but the bill was down where I was able to make monthly payments. Because I had already sought out to file bankruptcy because there's no way I could have done it. But I mean, just saying being out of network, you don't know, you don't know. Uh, you know, you get scared, you won't get the help. And I know that, you know, everybody has to get paid, but that's something I'm pretty much conscious of now if I have to do anything. Ask them in advance. It's just covered, so I don't have to worry about that. Yeah. And I'll address a little bit of that too. Okay. CJ is actually in our team. So. Oh, you know, so you know them yeah. too. So, yeah. <laughs> I hired CJ. Actually. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, CJ. Yeah. Yeah. Pass it over. Yeah, I know it's like, well, in the pocket, so.
40, 40. Mm -hmm. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. All right, awesome. Well, as Jim shared, I am Emily Sates Pollock and I serve as the vice president. I'm not, I'm wire, am I wireless? Yeah, I'm wireless. Uh, vice president of Revenue Cycle for Tri Health. And I'm, uh, it's an absolute honor to be here and pleasure. So, as Jason said, thank you so much for having us this evening. Um, I do want to take a quick moment because I we have some of our awesome uh, fellow Tri Health teammates that have. Uh, joined us this evening as well, so I do want to give them a moment to introduce themselves, um, and then I'll get into my section of the presentation. So, uh, Colleen, I'll start with you. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Colleen Kirkpatrick. I'm actually the system manager of patient relations, so that advocacy piece that Jason spoke about, that is my team, and we are excited to have the opportunity to help and serve you however you can if you have an experience at tri that you think could have been improved or you just have some questions we're definitely here to help with these problems. So um, I have the awesome privilege to be at the office of patient engagement. Thank you. Good. Hello my name is Doug Gardner. I'm the hospital billing director for tri -Health. Uh So go easy on me. <laughs> um, I live in that world. Billing is complicated. Uh, we're responsible for collecting. Uh, it is a complicated world. The rules change all the time. And, uh, you know, really our goal is to make uh, the billing experience as good as the clinical experience. And being at the end of the chain, so to speak, I hear a lot. Well, the care was great, but you guys screwed up my billing. You charged too much. And my hope is that we can get it right so that uh, the bill's processed correctly and uh, you have as great of an experience on the back end as you do on the front end. So uh, great to be here tonight. And uh, like I said, we'll answer any questions that we can. And uh, I've been with the organization for six months. <laughs> in, in the building, I'm a new guy, so go easy on me. <laughs> Hi, my name is Nancy Bennett. I'm customer service manager. I've been here only four weeks. Oh, I'm going to get fast. <laughs> my goal is to make everyone here have a great customer service experience here with TriHealth. If there's any questions or any concerns, you can call me directly and I'll assist you with your bills. I'll help you through the process of whatever you're dealing with. Okay. Glad to be here. Hi, I'm Rita McCoslin. I'm manager of Revenue Cycle. Um, I'm responsible for financial counseling, um, patient registration, um, call center, and then our central scheduling call center and operator call center as well. So more centralized. Um, if you're talking to somebody on the phone, there's a good chance it's um, one of my team members. So happy to be here. Thanks for having us. Awesome. Thanks, guys, again for being here. Um, so uh, before I kind of you know get into to hopefully giving you all a little bit better understanding of what I call the revenue cycle and I'll, I'll drill into this a little bit more um, you know I want to share my personal uh, story so I actually started my career actually at TriHealth when I was in college um, and was at TriHealth for about 11 and a half years and then actually was recruited away over to one of the competitors Mercy um, where I was there for nine years and I had the uh, again privilege to come back um, to TriHealth in 2017 so January of 2017 uh, to serve as the vice president of Revenue Cycle, and I really do consider Tri Health my home. Um, and I, I think, you know, obviously we're, you know, we're going through the formal uh, slides. Which again, my hope from all of this is that you, know, when you walk out of here, whether you have your services at Tri Health or not, certainly we all wish and pray and hope for the best possible outcomes for every single one of you. Um, but if you do have choices to pick, because we know sometimes your insurance, you know, dictates where you go. We talked about that out of network, net, um, you know, situation. Hopefully, you walk out of here with a better understanding of Tri Health, who we are, and what we're about. Um, I wish I could stand up here and say we are perfect and we will never make a mistake. Not possible. We are all human. But what I can very honestly tell you is that um, we have an amazing group of 13,000 team members that do truly care. Um, about you as individuals and, and your family members and caregivers and so forth and so on. And then again, we'll kind of address some of the stuff that um, Doug was talking about. But um, in my own, even though I don't have a prostate um, family background, prostate cancer, 
Uh, my mother, who just turned 64, uh, was diagnosed three weeks ago with stage four ovarian cancer. Um, so uh, I myself um, and my family, I'm the only uh, child in town. Um, so I am carrying the, the lion's share of that right now, helping my own mother um, navigate the system, um, right? So um, while I've always considered myself an advocate for patients, um, I actually wanted to be a doctor. Um, ended up on a little bit different track. Um, I'm using this as an opportunity to really have a critical eye, even within our own system, um, to really just make sure um, every opportunity we can to tweak, improve our service to you all, that's what we're doing. Um, so again, I wanted you to have a little bit of context on that. To answer just a couple of the, uh, or circle back on a couple of the things that were already talked about um, in the Jason's um, questions, we talk about you know the, the rising cost of health care so um, absolutely the hoops we have to jump through and I call them hoops um, you know from the insurance side are just as frustrating um, for us on the provider side as they are for you know us as consumers or patients um, so I think some of the to just give you a little bit of some of the stuff Tri Health is doing when we talk about moving to value-based health care and population health management as Jason said, our goal ultimately is to keep you out of a higher intensity service line, right? We don't want you to have to come into the emergency department. We don't want you to have to have a three or four or five day stay in the hospital, right? I'm sure many of you have done your own research. The longer you stay in a hospital, the chances of complications, right? Or sickness or, you know, whatever. And we don't want that because our job is to keep you healthy. That's our mission. Um, so again, we have to rethink as a system how we are delivering healthcare to you all. And that is, we have to be proactive. And we have to, you know, based on the evidence and the science and the best practices, we have to know all of the data about you as a patient and say, well, wait a minute, have you had your, you know, pneumonia vaccine? Have you had your shingles vaccine? Have you had this or that? Because, you know, studies show that if you don't get this you don't get that you're at higher risk for certain things so you'll start to feel or experience not just through tri health most likely but other organizations that are trying to be more proactive and get you as a consumer engaged in your health care um, so you're not putting off your annual visits and you're not putting off certain screenings and you're not putting stuff off so by doing all of that and getting better at that we start to prevent what we call the higher acuity services or the higher acuity admissions. So if you think about um, you know, what's involved in running an emergency room, right? So anytime a facility has an emergency room, it is a very high cost proposition because not only do you have to have highly trained emergency physicians, right? You have to have all of the support staff, the nursing staff, you have to have CT available, you have to have radiologists who can read the CT, all these other things, and that's just the short list, right? So that is a very high cost service, just like an inpatient admission. So the more and better we can keep you in an outpatient setting, the lower we can bring our operating costs, right? So that's a piece of the equation, and obviously that is not the main point of my conversation and topic tonight, but I wanted to hint, I wanted to speak to that just a little bit. And the other part of this is as we move to this value-based model, the way we are being paid by Medicare or by the various um, payers, like your commercial contracts, Humana, Anthem, United Healthcare, you know, whoever you guys have, is going to change. And they're gonna start, to, to Jason's earlier point, we are agreeing in contracts to say, these are the important things we need to measure, quality outcomes, the patient experience. And if we can show and demonstrate cost savings through the overall care and better clinical outcomes, we start to get into more value-based payments where we don't necessarily think about billing every single episode or every single click. Does that make sense at a high level? Now again, it's changing the wings on a plane flying at 30,000 feet, right? So we're talking about the entire industry is changing. Tri-Health, we're on, we're on, I would say, kind of the cutting edge of really trying to get aggressive in how we contract and partner with our payers to get the best outcomes and really change healthcare outcomes in our community. Um, in fact, if you hadn't seen, there was a big press release um, recently 
uh, between us and Anthem. So Anthem is named TriHealth, uh, their top performing accountable care organization in the country. Right? That's pretty awesome, right? So what does that mean though? That means through our partnership with Anthem and the aggressiveness with which we are going after, you know, how we take care of you all, we are proving results and we are reducing the cost of care. Now, what is step two to all of that, right? The, the next step that that translates into is when employers go to pick the insurance company that they want to work with, you're, we're going to eventually start to be able to translate those savings to the employer who then is able to translate them to their, their employees who are obviously paying premiums and so forth and so on. That's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen you know, next month. But that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to change this whole universe that we are in where, you know, while we can't stop it, we still have to continue kind of existing in the world we're in. But we're also, as we like to say, we've got two feet in two separate canoes right now, right? Or a single foot in each canoe trying to stay afloat but also evolve to this new model. Does that at a high level make sense? The third thing I would add is that we as an organization um, you know, are having to make some tough decisions as we start to get paid differently and reimbursement is definitely going to shrink. We have to figure out how to get more efficiencies and use technology um, so that, you know, we don't always think a person or an adding another person is what solves the equation, right? Um, and I know that's a, that's a you know, sensitive subject sometimes because we don't want to think about people losing jobs and it's not you know, about that. But those are some of the tough decisions we as an organization have to make sometimes is you know, we've got to eliminate cost in the system in order to not only survive but in our new world, but because we're trying to really change the, the, the infrastructure of healthcare. So does that help give a little bit of context? Um, and then excellent point um, back there about out of network. So to your point, as much as I would love for you all to come to TriHealth, um, I have no idea what insurance you all have. Um, and you know, chances are your insurance um, dictates where you go. Um, so absolutely always make sure, um, except if you have Medicare, traditional Medicare, or most of the Medicare HMO plans, um, you know, you absolutely can come to TriHealth. But if you have a, a commercial plan as primary, make sure you do look in, in, in whatever facility you're going to, make sure they are in network, because that's where you're gonna get your best or optimized benefits um, versus if you go out of network um, to another facility. And sometimes you may have to. Um, I will put a little plug that if you're ever told you have to go um, to an out of network facility because they only have this machine or they only have this service, then I would, I would call that hospital's advocacy team. And a lot of times what can happen is we can negotiate a, a, a one-time case rate that's in network for that procedure. Does that make sense? Now the, the trick is you gotta do it before you have the procedure, right? But just a little nugget to think about if you're ever told you know, to go here and they're out of network, just first of all, I would challenge, like, well, why do I have to go there? You know, because they're out of network with my insurance. And if they say, well, they only have this doctor and he's the only doctor that can do this within a certain radius, or they only have this machine in the city, then just know you've got a little bit more negotiating power um, with the insurance company to try to, um, and usually your managed care team or someone in RevCycle would go to the insurance company and say, hey, we've got patient Emily, she needs to have this. Here's why we need to request an in-network um, exemption, if you will. And obviously, you want to get it documented and so forth and so on. And then they would, they, if approved, they would treat it like you're in-network, even if you're technically going to an out-of-network facility. Is that helpful? All right, awesome. OK, um, let's see here. I think those were the couple of things you talked about. OK, so now I'll jump into my actual presentation, right? So OK. What is, when we say revenue cycle, so obviously that's, you know, my official title. Um, revenue cycle is very complicated and it's a bigger world than probably most people realize. So it really is, I love this, um, you know, I say revenue cycle is a team sport because it truly is. We are dependent, it's the process all the way from the start. So, you know, my teams um, have a unique uh, situation in that we touch the patients pre-service, during service, and after service, right? 
So it's the start of you scheduling an appointment, right? So that starts the revenue cycle continuum because we create your account in our system, right? Then you go and you see your clinician or your doctor or whoever you're gonna see and you have your test or you have your exam. They have to do their documentation and the charging part. So they are documenting what they're doing and they're, they're picking the buttons that says, you know, hey, I did an exam or I did, you know, an EKG or I did an ultrasound or I did whatever. And that, that's similar whether you're in an office visit or you're in a hospital having a test or a procedure. So they have to do all of that, right? So they don't report to revenue cycle whatsoever, but my teams are completely dependent on them doing their part timely and accurately so that it can then flow to the rest of my teams, which then we have coder, coders that pick up all that legal or clinical um, medical jargon and put it into the coding language, right? Which is what our payers want. And then we're able to get it to our billing teams to then meet all of the payer requirements of what they want on the claim to then submit it to the insurance company, hopefully for payment, first time around. Um, and then if there's a balance for the patient based on their benefits, we then bill the patient. So again, that is a very high level summary and I'll give you some other um, pictures, but that is what revenue cycle management is. It's a very large, very complicated process. Um, what I want you to know about the vision I've laid out for the team, um, and again, what I hope you find is that not only myself, but my team, in including my amazing teammates here in the room, is that you know we are people just like you guys, right? Um, we're, we're your neighbors, we pass you in the grocery stores, um, and we, this is the vision I've given my teams in RevCycle. I want us to be world-class and top decile. Are we gonna get there tomorrow? Nope. Are we gonna ever reach the pinnacle? No, because everything keeps changing around us, right? But what are we gonna do? We are gonna strive every single day to perfect our processes, gain efficiencies, but most of all, um, and, and this is kind of the strategy of how we're gonna do this internally, we're going to do all of this with compassion, humility, and kindness because that's what matters most. And that's what TriHealth is about, our mission to serve people and, and really be the hearts and, and, and feet and hands of compassion in our community. And that's what I want you to experience when you experience what we, what we refer to as the billing process, right? Um, which is more complicated than just the billing process. So again, simplified, uh, if, you, if you learned kind of through a pictorial view, and hold on, Jim gave me this, let me see if this works here. Handy, or Tom, wait, yeah, Jim gave me this. I'm gonna use your fancy clicker here. Um, so this is just kind of a picture, again, still simplified of what you all, so I'm, I'm assuming everybody in this room has had at least some type of experience with healthcare, a healthcare system at least. So, you know, kind of at the point where you've scheduled slash pre-registration and that's the process where obviously they collect um, insurance information they validate your demographics um, and let me just we'll put a plug in here i know that that can get annoying when you feel like you're asked that information all the time but let me assure you that it is for good reason that we do that is for your safety we want to absolutely make sure we have the right patient because believe it or not, even if you think you have the most rare or unique name, um, chances are I could do a name search in our database and find at least two or three other patients with the exact same name, right? Um, and you think about the, the medical implications that could happen if I pull up, I'm gonna pick on you, Mr. Ethan, if I pull up the wrong Ethan record, right? I'm looking, the doctor could be looking at this Ethan's records, his medication history, his surgical history, and make decisions based on that, which could have an adverse outcome on this Mr. Ethan. Does that make sense? Yeah. So again, I apologize we ask you for a lot, but I don't apologize because it's for your safety. Um, and that's our, that's our number one goal is to keep you safe. Um, so again, then you get to the hospital part. So we talk about that's registration. So that's when you get into the system. And it could be a physician office as well, where you might uh, finish a few uh, demographics, sign your consents typically. Um, and, and a piece of that consent process is giving us permission to bill your insurance in a lot of cases, um, if you have insurance, obviously. Um, we talked about this piece. So this is this charge capture. That's, again, where the clinical part of the team 
has to document what they did, their findings, any tests or procedures, so we even know what to code to put on the claim to go to the insurance. Utilization review is typically, um, if you're having some type of mostly inpatient service, um, it can happen in some cases on outpatient, like surgeries and stuff. But this is where we talk about all the payer rules. So um, I wish I could say every single insurance company had, had the same rules that we had to abide by, but they don't, right? So it is a constant game of figuring out what the rules are for the day. And so there are nurses that are actually on the floors and they are reviewing cases and they are talking to the doctors and they are calling the insurance company to say hey i've got emily here in room 407 she's got this is her chief complaint the doctor is doing this we think she's going to stay in the hospital for two more nights um, do you give us an approval right those authorizations and those approvals are very very important to not only us as a hospital but to you as a patient because that is telling us in most cases that the insurance company agrees with uh, the medical necessity of why you're in the hospital and they're going to likely pay whatever your benefits say they're going to pay. When you don't get those authorizations, that's where we get into the not so fun stuff. I Can see I Ethan has a question. question. Yeah. Will you do, do you do that also with Medicare? Uh-huh. Because? So Medicare typically doesn't require that type of authorization. Okay. Now, on the, now Medicare HMO plans do. Um, and again, they're all a little bit different. So that's where, you know, part of all, and that's a whole different team, um, our utilization review and case management teams, they have to be up on all of that detail and what the payer's requiring, because it changes. Not only can it change annually, it can sometimes change quarterly. Yeah, I'll ask yep. you why, I'll ask you why, because, okay, like I've been told, okay, you need an MRI for mm -hmm. a prostate or whatever. Yeah. And I say, well, will Medicare cover it? And they said, I don't know. I don't know, yeah. So now on the outpatient side, it's a little bit different. So on the outpatient side of the house, um, we use what we call a, an NCD or an LCD. So you've got national coverage determinations or local coverage determinations. And in short, what that means is that Medicare has decided that for this test or this procedure, these are the diagnoses that they will agree to pay. So all hospital systems that do MRIs or CTs or whatever, we have to buy software that we literally take when the doctor writes your order for his MRI or your MRI or whatever, we run it through this software to see if there is a NCD or, or LCD that applies to that. And it'll kick out an answer if there is, and it'll say, oh, this diagnosis passes, or it may come back and say, eh, this diagnosis doesn't cover it, and then what our what the approach whether it's tri health or someone else should be is hey doc this isn't passing based on what you've listed today in the chart are there any other symptoms or you know, signs that the patient's having that we should document that might get it to pass does that make sense yeah but you know where that leaves us as a patient and if it's mri maybe it's a couple of thousand dollars but it could be some right. procedure that's twenty thousand dollars they won't tell you in advance Right. If Medicare will or will not cover it, right. which is like, hello. Yeah, no, they should, in theory, and that's, this isn't just applicable to TriHealth, no, especially on the Medicare side. Um, and, and again, we're going to continue to see evolution in this of, and it's not, I'm not saying it's easy, where we are more and more required to give, especially Medicare, my vision is I want us to be able to do it for all patients, um, it, information in advance so you can make an informed decision. Not saying it's perfect today, and is I'm, I'm hoping you're getting little nuggets of how complicated it is that we literally have to have software, you know, that literally we update at least quarterly because Medicare changes the rules quarterly on us. Yeah, but it's outrageous, outrageous that they, that they yeah. were, sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. no, I'm saying it's outrageous that Medicare leaves you in the cold not knowing right. whether it's going to be covered Whether it's going to be covered, yeah. Yeah, sorry. To, well, I thought and I wish I could change Medicare. You have to tell Medicare in advance so you can make an informed decision. Who's no. the you? No. We as a provider, as, well, as we're evolving, what should be happening in most situations is, is a, the, the LCD or NCD software is run. And so when the doc says, hey, we need you to have this, and it could be at the doctor's office or it could be through our scheduling process, we run that software 
So when we call you to pre-register you, if it hasn't been addressed at the doctor's office level and there's a concern, we should be having that conversation with you at the time of scheduling that says, hey, this test is not passing for the NCD or LCD well, check, this, and then you'd be informed. This is the thing that AARP has brought up uh, at least a couple of times, I believe, and it's turning out to be a bit of a scandal. People who go to the emergency room and they are put into a hospital bed for one or more nights, and then they end up getting a bill because it was for observation, observation and not yeah. actually checked in. Right. And Medicare doesn't pay for observation, but right. for all practical purposes to the patient, it looks like I'm staying in the hospital, I'm I've been checked in. Yep. Do you guys inform the patient yes. beforehand? Yes. Because although a lot of people may say good health is priceless, I'm not independently wealthy. Correct. And so I want to know in advance yep. what I'm going to expect. Absolutely. And I have to say, I actually am a tri-health person. Mm -hmm. I asked my doctor one day, how much am I being charged for this? He didn't have a clue. Yeah. He said, have you had a tetanus shot recently? And I said, well, no. And so he says, I'll give you one. The tetanus shot was $99, whereas the uh, vaccination turned out to be covered. It was only $5, and that was covered. And he didn't once tell me, but this isn't going to be covered by your insurance. Right. And I called up to complain about it, lack of information, and they just said, sorry. Right. So let me address a couple things. So, and, and the doctor really doesn't know how much everything's costing. Right. And let me argue that you that's not what you want the doctor to know but to your point we as an organization I'm sorry, what do i not want the doctor to know we don't want the doctor to be the expert in the pricing that's other support services uh, in my space might, might turn out to be a better system in the long run well that's what we're working on so let me and it's actually part of our um some of the stuff we're working on to be able to give you that information to answer your other question yes the our care management and uh, actually our care management teams when you come in through the ed there's a process and it's actually mandated by medicare where you do have to be given a letter and and, and someone walks you through it to say you're in observation state status even though you're going to a bed right, because like you said do you also tell them what the consequence is if they're covered by medicare yes because it's all that they really say yeah. you're being observed yes it is it's all spelled out in the letter so the patient understands the financial implication of whatever status they're being put into but yeah, that is, that is part of our process is to inform the patient in advance. And then the, the, on the um, second topic, so, and the reason I say that is we want the doctors to be the clinical experts. Absolutely, we want to put the information in your hand about pricing. Um, and it's actually at the, one of the end of my slides. We're actually literally in our soft rollout right now. We're literally training our staff. Um, we just built out our patient estimation uh, module within our uh, software system and we're going to start rolling that out in phases actually in January um, to be able to give you as the consumer information about and it'll actually be um, tailored if you will more so to your insurance right because everybody's insurance is different um, your deductibles are different your co-pays are different all of that stuff so we would run a real-time eligibility check at the time of um, the service or scheduling or whatever and say, based on your benefits today and based on what you're having, this is what uh, we believe your estimated out of pocket is going to cost. And that's what we're evolving to. But I thought you just got done saying though, at the beginning of that, that you uh, want the doctor to be the clinician and not worry about the cost. But not I have to say my practical experience with tetanus shots is, I actually needed a tetanus shot in my 20s because I stepped on a nail that went through my foot, rusty nail. And they said, well, have you had a tetanus shot recently? Most people can't remember well, whether it was four yeah. years ago or seven years ago. So to be on the safe side, they give you a tetanus shot. Right. So one of your doctors gave me the tetanus shot for whatever reason, just in case, and that was a $99 thing. Now, if he'd said to me, do you want it? I said, well, in practicality, it's not going to make much difference. I don't have tetanus right now. I haven't had an experience where I'm going to get tetanus right now. So you know what? I'll save the $99 for my kid to go to college. Right. Right. Point taken. Yes, sir. I have a question. Um, uh, when they're doing the risk, registration that you were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. you know, they call me and want to go over the medical mm -hmm. the history and oh, she had everything. Uh, if she was going over, if she was going over your medical history. Yeah. Uh, so so that's your like pre yeah the pre-admission testing. Yeah, pre yep. uh -huh. yes. yep. She did all that, and I had the physical. But what I'm asking, and 
uh, they always say, um, if, if, if you think that you're being, you know, put out the hospital sooner than you think, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. and stuff like that, does try help offer the same thing? Yes, well, sir. It's like tomorrow, and I'm supposed to spend the night. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Stephanie is like Sarah, I'm saying, hey, Doc, man, I'm, yeah. you know, I don't think I can make it. Mm -hmm. Can he actually, you know, do they go ahead and let you go, or the Medicare say, hey, look, go ahead and keep it? Yep. That's what they were trying to explain to me. Absolutely. Out yeah, so, um, so that's a. I'll answer that shortly, but it's a it's somewhat complicated. But absolutely, so Medicare in particular has a whole nother uh, I'll call it quality agency, an external body um, that's not part of trial. So if it's part of your Medicare patient rights, so if a patient um, you know is being told, hey, we think you're ready to be discharged, and to your point, you don't feel like you're ready, and you know you you try the first approach with the physician and you say hey here's what's going on and they still don't think you meet medical necessity then that is when you invoke that other process and it's you basically engage this third party which can happen through the care coordinator um, that would be working on your case and they would more or less call this third party to medicare um, and you would give them the facts and so and it's basically kind of like puts your case on hold while they figure out what they think is the next best step for you and everybody gets aligned. Does that help? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Our patient advocates work <laughs> with, with yeah. care management um, on, on those types of conversations. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Um, okay. So, oh, yes, go. Yeah. Here's something I'd like to find out if we keep, keep from happening sometime. My daughter had a situation where she's she went in and uh, she's having a baby and turned by C-section. She's laying in there. Next day, a doctor comes in and says that we're not cold. Totally come in, check her incision, and everything. Oh yeah, everything looks fine. Out the door goes. She gets this big bill come, that comes in. This doctor is not part of her insurance plan. She didn't call him in. The hospital called him in, and she's getting this huge bill because he was out of network. And out of network. Okay. Huh? Was that at a tri health facility? No, this is not a price. Okay. Obviously, I can't speak to Christ. Um, no, but, uh, I've, yeah. I've heard of this happening. You know, other right. places. Mm -hmm. You go to an emergency room and, yep. and you're dying. They fix you up and they know your insurance plan. They, down there, they knew her insurance plan. Right. And yeah. they pull in some doctor who's obviously yeah. not in her insurance plan. Yeah. So what we, as an organization, um, so our managed care team, when they go to negotiate those contracts, that is absolutely one of the things that we look at because we don't want that happening to a patient. Because to your point, when you go to the emergency room, you don't have any idea that the emergency room doctors or the L and D person that comes in isn't a technical, isn't technically employed by TriHealth, and they're a third party. So that's what our managed care team does um, is to make sure we prevent situations like that. I, I wanted to make sure it wasn't a TriHealth situation, yeah. but obviously right. I'm sorry that happened. Um, but that's what you hope is happening at the other organizations is that they're aware of who they're partnering with and then when they go to negotiate with Anthem or whoever, they make sure that same that doctor group also has a tier one contract with that, that payer as well. Yes, is there something in, 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 in we're signing up for all the stuff you guys see anymore? This is we can sign and say do not assign me to doctors that are that are not part of my insurance yeah no i think what what i think you could what hopefully your daughter did in that situation is obviously reach out to christ you know patient advocacy or customer service group to other places. absolutely yeah yeah but yeah no so our our way to try to prevent that is we manage it from a, con a contracting perspective so well yes sir when you say people have to code these things does each insurance agency a insurance provider have a different set of codes or are they standardized or they yep it's a standardized yeah so um coders and there's and if i don't know how much you guys read this so um a couple years ago the united states um converted to the 10th version of medical coding um believe it or not we were actually behind other countries um in that conversion it was a massive conversion there's over seventy thousand different codes Exactly, right? And we wonder why healthcare is complicated. 
Um, that's actually a, a comedy for you one day. To some of the codes that now exist are absolutely hilarious. But if you think about it, why are they doing it? Data, right? At the national level, they're trying to understand all these different things. I mean, you can find, you know, hit by a dolphin. I'm not joking. That's a code now. Um, so, um, yeah. So to your point, they are standardized. Um, that's not. That's probably about the only thing that is standardized. There are um, on the, the forms, the electronic claim forms that we submit, um, there is a lot of standardization around that. But where you get into the, the variation is in the payer's medical policies um, so, and or your plan benefits. So just because this payer, you know, I'm gonna pick on Anthem, just because Anthem says they're gonna pay for this code doesn't mean, you know, Humana is gonna pay for this code. And that's where you have to really make sure you know your benefits and are doing your research as best as you can um, prior to having something done. But yes, the codes are standardized. Um, I'm gonna keep us moving here quickly. Um, so again, this again was more in the, the inpatient setting. We talked about coding. Um, and then there's follow-up. So you know, all of this happens, you've had your service, and now the, the, I'll say the materials have been coded, and they now get to our billing teams. And then that's where the other fun starts. So then we've got all the different payer rules of what fields they want, how they want it formatted, how they want it. And again, they're all different. So we have hundreds and hundreds of edits that we have to build and we're constantly having to modify them to put in the system to what we say hopefully get to a clean claim, meaning we think we have the payers, what they want figured out. We build all these edits. We have the form that meets those requirements. And then we send it electronically to the payer. And again, knock on wood, and I'll, I'll show another pictorial here in a second. If all goes well and, we, and it's a clean claim and they accept it, hopefully they pay it quickly because then that's what allows us to get their response back. And then if there is a patient balance, get it to you in a timely fashion because there's nothing worse than having a service and getting a bill a year later, right? So, um, but we are dependent on the insurance company and there's a lot of craziness that can happen in that space. Um, another kind of picture of this, when we talk about revenue cycle, the reason we talk about uh, it being a cycle is those same kind of processes we talked about and I told you this is at the center of what we're aiming for. The faster and smoother and more efficient we can do all these processes, the faster that wheel is going to spin and the faster we can get the revenues in the door, if you will, and drive out unnecessary duplication costs in the back, right? We sp I mean, you would not believe the amount of time and energy my team spend on the phone just trying to get a response from the payers. Yes, I did. Because I'm sure you've been through it. Yeah. Absolutely, and we get we we don't have a we don't have a bat phone to them. Like I have team members that literally can wait on the phone for an hour just to get through. So you think about that in context of the millions of claims annually. Any healthcare system is trying to get out the door and get paid, so you as a a customer know what you owe like timely. That's the piece we can't change directly and that's the frustrating part for us as well Did yes that person just sit there for an hour and they can't do anything else no they're usually working i mean they're trying to multitask yeah. you know they're trying to work other accounts notate other things get their work or you know prioritize and again we give all that feedback back to our payers um but you know there's no incentive for them obviously um to to have to process faster but that's a very real and being very transparent a very real frustration that we deal with on our side yes jack that experience you're speaking of there for me uh, i'm uh, frightened to even call anybody if i want to call you tomorrow yep it please might, it might be five o'clock before you get to me right and then all you do is get the message and i'm on the phone all the entire right. day i hope everybody else don't have that Right. Like that, I do. right. And it is very frustrating. You don't know what to do. Right. Or you'll get passed around from a person to person. Yep. Who doesn't know? Are you are you in the may I are you in the trial system or somewhere else? In some in San Okay, okay. 
I was going to say, obviously, we'll take your name and number and we'll help facilitate if that was the case. Um, but, but in all honesty, I mean, call St. Elizabeth. We know we have a relationship with them as well. They're great people. They, I guarantee you, have a patient advocacy group as well. I would ask to speak to their patient advocacy team um, and just say, I need help. I'm you know, newly diagnosed. I need someone to help me get to where I need to go to get some answers. Emily. Yes, sir. You go to the doctor. You're in the waiting room right now, okay? Mm -hmm. You might have two or three uh, receptions mm -hmm. here. You ever see them very busy on the phone? Oh, no. Busy. No, that's not no. 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 And yet, all, when you go to call, you're on the phone for a right. week. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So are you trying? Are you trying to get into like a um, like just a, a physician visit, or are you trying to get into services at the hospital at Saint? Anything. Okay. Uh, all right. When I was diagnosed with this prostate cancer, the uh, I was the urologist and oncologist. They wanted me to start me on these different medicines. Okay. Before I, I had also take dialysis too. Right. And most of these, most any of other physicians are kind of afraid of their diagnosis, their uh, treatments, and their plans don't always work out for me. And you know they have to get with dialysis people. Okay. What have you found out? What am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to take this medicine or not? Mm -hmm. This is the kind of Thing I run into all the time. Mm -hmm. So, going back to the original reason I raised my hand, mm -hmm. I could be sitting on the phone at home all day, just wait for an answer. Do I take it or don't I? Yep. Is dialysis said okay? Uh, <clears throat> you want me to come tomorrow uh, for a treatment? I've got dialysis today. You don't want me to eat for 12 hours before. I'm strong, but. Yeah, well, that's a long time, yeah. Yes, after doing that. Right, yeah. Very strong, and very right. hard. Right. What do I do? Right. Have you, um, and again, I, obviously I don't know the St. Elizabeth system, you know, inside and out, but if, if I were you, and again, please, Jason, jump in if you have another, I mean, I would either be getting a hold of my doctor and having a stern conversation and say, look, I need help, I'm not getting answers, I'm scared, I don't know what to do, and I'm just waiting around. I would call the patient advocacy. Um, those would be my two suggestions. Yeah, if I could jump in, yeah, I would say call your patient, your patient relations team. I know that my team, we get calls like that sometimes. Yeah. And we know who the practice administrators are. Yeah. We have relationships with the doctors. So you may be trying to get through to the receptionist and not having luck. We're going to call the practice administrator and say, hey, this is the issue. Let's fix it today. So, so I always encourage have a couple of conversations, right? So if the registration office is not working for you, get with your, call the patient relations, because that's what we're here to do. We're here to serve. We're here to help navigate the difficulties that you're having mm -hmm. with getting perfect care. Mm -hmm. And anything that's less than perfect care, that's what we're here to navigate for you, because we want each and every person to have an experience of perfect care and not have the frustration. You have so many other things to think about than whether or not you're gonna get a call back so that's what we're here to do for you. Well, I think it, it kind of, it's, it's similar to, and again, I have had this similar, obviously not prostate, but ovarian, facilitating my mom as well. But kind of to the earlier comment from Kurt, um, and it's, it's unfortunate that there are so many cases of cancer collectively, you know, across the communities being diagnosed, that the doctors, you know, you got to think about, they're in surgery some days, they have clinic visits some days so as much as absolutely we want to get we wish we could get every single patient if, you know the second you're diagnosed it's almost like oh my goodness we would love to send you right next door you know to the oncologist but it is it does become an access issue and again I can't speak to St. Elizabeth um, but again I appreciate you maybe helping him out too but those are the, those are the suggestions we would have for you to, to talk to your doctor and say I need help and the patient advocate um, over it. Heard of a patient advocate yep. within their they do yeah. we they have them i thought they did yeah, yeah. We, we, we can we can get you the yep are they called anything else what's that 
I've never heard the term patient. It would be patient relations. Patient, patient relations. relations. Patient, yeah. patient representative, something What some people actually do is yeah. they hire their own negotiator yeah. who works on a commission and they, and they facilitate. Out, but they're not yeah. associated with the hospital or your yeah. insurance company. They only work for you. Yeah. Well, he's talking more right, and his concern is more about just getting in for the visits themselves. So it's really navigating the system. He hasn't even gotten to the bill part yet. Well, I mean, I had a similar problem. Yeah. I had been going to Health First Physicians before your company bought them, and I had been patient, but I'd been good in health, and I didn't want to abuse the service. I hadn't gone in for six months, not even for a physical. Then I started having a symptom, and I went in, and they said, well, you're not a patient any longer. And so luckily, I found somebody who had listened to me for a half an hour, which took a lot of patience on their part, but they finally put me back into the system and I got to see my doctor. But that's try health mm -hmm. saying, well, you haven't seen my do your doctor for six months, we don't, or six years, we don't want you anymore. Mm -hmm. They told you that? Pardon? They told you that? Yeah. I was out of their system. And I don't know if that's because try health bought them and said, weed your system of uh, records where there hasn't been any activity. Yeah, I can't, I don't know the details That's of that. That's like people here yeah. in Ohio who haven't voted for uh, eight years, which is their right, and okay. so they just knock them off the woods. Right, yeah. Yeah, we don't, we don't delete records. Now, again, if there, if there was an acquisition, I have no idea what the legal, you know, terms of that was. But as a system, if you've been a patient at TriHealth, we don't, just because you haven't been there for a long time. Now, after years and years and years, we may not see details. Uh, but I'm talking years and years and years. But you're like a, a what I'll call a skeleton profile would still be in the system. So again, there must have been some nuances in that situation that I can't speak to. I apologize for that. Uh, but yeah, unfortunately, healthcare has gotten overly complicated. Right. Um, and so Colleen and I's job is to help get it simplified and to help people navigate the system because it's just entirely too complicated. And we need to center it around the patient, not around providers. Right. Um, so again, high level, just some terms which will help kind of um, set context for the next couple of things I want to go through quickly. So Epic is the system we use. You've probably heard of that. Um, a lot of healthcare companies use this system now, especially in Cincinnati. Um, if you ever hear people talk about Epic, um, it's the, probably the largest um, healthcare software uh, company in the world. They're actually global. Um, if you ever hear the term SBO, um, that's single billing office, and, um, and again, I'll get into that in just a minute. Guarantor is a term, that's the person responsible for the bill. So think about if you had kids, um, obviously we're not going to bill a four-year-old, right? So mom or dad would be listed as the guarantor. Um, whereas if, as long as you're 18 or older or an adult, if you don't have you know, other um, reasons not to be, you would also be listed as your own guarantor also. Um, a subscriber, the term subscriber is a term we use to say who carries the insurance. So for example, my husband carries the insurance for our family. So anytime I would register, I would have to give his name and information because he's the one primarily on the policy. And then I would be obviously um, a beneficiary on that policy. Um, eligibility, we talked a little bit about that, but that's a process too where we um, run uh, your demographics and the insurance information you give to us, not again, not unique to TriHealth, um, any, uh, most I should say, systems do this, and it basically pings up against an electronic database to validate that um, you have Anthem, you know, blue access insurance or whatever you said, because that's a very critical part of the process to making sure they're going to pay the bill or pay their portion of the bill accurately and hopefully save you as the subscriber um, headaches you know from them not paying it or denying it um, a claim that's the term we use in our um, in, in shop if you will we send an electronic claim to the provider whereas we bill or send you all a statement so um, just again a little bit of nuance and language Explanation of benefits, um, that is what your insurance company sends you, okay? Not to be confused with the statement, right? 
So your insurance company is going to send you an explanation of benefits every time you have a service and that's what's going to tell you based on your individual policy what the allowable was meaning what they agreed or negotiated where you stand on your deductible what your um, estimated out-of-pocket is based on that claim right and again not to be confused with what we actually send you so an explanation of benefits is not a bill and, it, and they should always say this is not a bill um, mm -hmm. But a lot of times what people do is when they get their statement or their bill from us is then they're going to compare that to their explanation of benefits and make sure they're, align they're aligning with what you're seeing, right? Now what's important to, to know, which you may or may not know, is in a lot of cases, um, you know, insurance companies can go back and adjust things, you know, even as far back as a year or two, right? So a lot of times we might even as a surprise to us all of a sudden get you know they might decide to do a, a mass claims um, adjustment and all of a sudden we start getting you know new information on a claim that we thought was handled you know six months a year ago or whatever and so I, I share that again that's not unique to try health but if you ever all of a sudden think you've paid for this service a long time ago and then all of a sudden you know months down the road or even a year you're getting something that says to the contrary don't i'll just say don't assume the hospital messed something up we're likely the hospital's likely reacting to some new information they got from the insurance company wish that wasn't the case but it happens it doesn't happen it doesn't happen every single day but just know that it does periodically happen um, prior authorization or pre-authorization again that's another critical process you just want to make sure you understand your benefits and for example if you're having an MRI or a CT or surgeries a lot of the higher cost items typically will require some type of authorization prior to having the service done and you simply want to validate that that process has happened most of the time the physician or the hospital um, takes ownership of that but it's just a good question to say, hey, has the authorization been secured on this before you go back for the test or the procedure? And who's going to tell you that? They'll tell it, They should. And again, depending on what system you go to, if, if we have in our process is if we don't have an authorization, at least by the day before, and again, we're at the mercy of the insurance company, we would be calling your physician office and trying to get a hold of you as a patient at least... The, by the day before if not sooner to say hey we wanted to give you a heads up we are still working to get this authorization but as of this moment we don't have it and the insurance company might be telling us we have they have three to five days to respond um, so it, again another we are at the mercy of the insurance company so what our what we always try to do is work things or get the process started as quickly as we can um, but again we don't we don't have any control over the payer okay Absolutely, yes. Right, so last summer, my doctor wanted me to get a CT for my lung. I had pneumonia. Okay. Uh -huh. So I called. He wanted me to go to Jewish. And um, I, I had called Jewish and told him, okay, is this, a, is this authorized? Mm -hmm. And the lady said, oh, sure, it's authorized. Well, how do I know that she really knows? I mean, I didn't get anything in writing. Right. It's just a Say so. Yeah, usually you don't. Sometimes, and again, most of the time you don't. Sometimes your insurance company, again, they're all different. Sometimes they may send you a letter that just says, you know, just so you know, for your records, we did authorize this test. Um, but that's what I'm saying. I would ask the question because it'll be documented in the system. So either when you talk to the physician office or to the hospital, because really it's if the procedure is being done at the hospital, the onus is on the hospital to make sure it's been secured. So you would ask the scheduler or the registrar, right. is this in indeed authorized? Right. And they right. should be able to tell you yes, and here's the authorization number. Ah, so there's a number. Absolutely, it's, we document it because we actually put it on the claim right. so that they know they told us that they would pay for it. So that's a takeaway that Absolutely. authorization, authorization number. number. Yep, gotcha. yeah. and again, not all tests or procedures require them. But make sure you look at your insurance um, to know that. But if it's a higher dollar test, chances are it does require one. Yes, sir. I wonder if um, some of this stuff is available on my charts. Like, for example, 
I say I'm supposed to be going in for an MRI, mm -hmm. and that that needs I don't, it needs to be pre-authorized. Uh -huh. would, would, is there some place in my charts where I could go and see? I, I know I can go and see. I'm scheduled for that process. Right. I'm supposed to be there on Tuesday. Is there somewhere where I would say approved? This is going to be paid for. Yeah. Um, there's not today, but we'll take that down as a takeaway to see what the possibility of that is. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking out loud, um, more so as our team gets that authorization, there might be a way for us to at least convert that into, um, not necessarily that you would need to see the number, although you could totally see it, to a more of a approved or denied or in process status. So I, I have I see Rita taking that down. We will take that back as a as feedback to see if we can do it. But it does not exist today. Um, okay. But we can certainly look at that. The the challenge gets into it's all of the um, all or nothing. So I wouldn't want you to go in there and if you don't see it, then assume that it's not approved because it may not even require an approval. So it goes into how do we how do we build the logic so we don't cause unnecessary harm if you don't see it in there. Does that make okay. sense? That's but it's fine. but it's a very good suggestion, and we will take it down and see if we can potentially solve for that. Um, okay, so really quickly here, so high level, what I want you guys to understand just about the the what I'll call the billing or the statement process. Okay, so at the point, assuming you have insurance in play, at the point that the insurance company sends us back a response and tells us, okay, and I'm going to pick on you again, Ethan. Ethan owes fifty dollars on this test or whatever that information comes back to us right and then we are going to send you a statement now the way trihealth um, is set up we combine our hospital and physician services that are trihealth so if you're a tri seeing a trihealth physician um, uh, we combine those onto a single statement versus sending you a single statement for every single time you come in we also combine it to the point that you get one statement every 28 days. So if you have an account with us, um, you're going to get, um, and again, high level, you're going to get three statements. And I'm actually going to flip to this next, or sorry, this next slide because it'll show you a little bit differently visually. So you're going to get three statements from us kind of under process one, okay? So every 28 days, you're going to get a new statement. And, and I say we, we print it every 28 days, obviously, you know, depending on the mail or whatever, you might get it a couple days after that. Um, and on that, again, you'll keep getting those until you've either engaged with our customer service team, so that's the 569-6117 number you dial, um, to either pay, pay online, send in a check, however you pay your bills, or you call to set up a payment plan, okay? So until you get engage with us and either pay in full or set up on a payment plan, we're going to keep sending you a statement, right? If by basically day 83 of statement dates, if your account is still unresolved, meaning you haven't paid or you haven't called us to tell us what's going on or called to say, hey, I, you know, I'm concerned about this. You know, do you have financial assistance, which I'll address here in a minute as well. Um, you're going to then, we're going to move your account to another process and you're likely going to get a packet from a company called care payment okay because what we're assuming here in this is if you haven't paid or if you haven't called likely you have financial anxiety right and we are now going to send you a different option to consider um, now what i hope through the end of all of this is that i don't want you to have that financial anxiety and fear and questions i want you to call us um, and engage us so we can help you like the the gentleman that you know talked about CJ so CJ is one of our financial counselors and we meet with patients we screen you and see what things you might be eligible for based on a qualification perspective so care payment is a um, is, is think of it as a zero percent interest loan that gives you some long even longer payment terms based on your balance if necessary no cost to you it's something TriHealth wants to do for its patients if again for the larger bills you know if you're having trouble financially we can give you a longer payment term in this day um, day one through day 83 process in most cases we can actually go up to 18 months if necessary again depending on balance on a payment plan so just so you know that's one of the you know financial options we have so again i don't want patients on top of everything you're dealing with stressing thinking, oh my goodness, I got this $1,000 bill that I got to pay tomorrow. 
we will work with you and we have other options for you. Um, and then, you know, just in full transparency again, if by day 133, so think about how much time, you know, we're trying to give patients the opportunity to engage with us, pay their bills, set up a payment plan, whatever, you know, apply for financial assistance. If, if, if nothing's happening by day 133, then that's when your account moves into what we call the collections process and you'll start getting phone calls or letters from other people. I'm here to tell you, please don't let that happen. Engage with us prior to that so we can help you and get it figured out. And you guys yes, we touch base with patients mm -hmm. prior to that, so we make calls. Absolutely. Well. So, yeah. so part of this, which you'll see, is all between this <coughs> process, day one, or actually you even get them after that, but all of this time, you're going to periodically get uh, what we call courtesy phone calls. And that is the primary role of that is to make sure you got your statement because obviously there could be mailing issues, right? Um, so we want to make sure you got your statement. Um, I loved you put a nice plug out there for us for my chart. So if you come to Tri Health, um, we have what you call my chart, which is the patient portal within Epic, um, where you can also see your your statements and stuff now as well and pay online. Um, but you're getting phone calls periodically to see if you have questions and or make sure you've got your statement in that process. I wanted to uh, mm -hmm. say that this is really wonderful that you have all of this worked out where you have patients and their spouses and everybody who's dealing with all these problems can hopefully you know navigate through all this. It's a, so I want to give you an example of what happened to my wife and I. This goes back 18 years ago. Now, none of this was done for us and how tragic this all turned out. My wife went in for an outpatient surgery and she should have gone home that afternoon. She was in intensive care for weeks. Mm -hmm. And in the big picture of it all, she's been in the hospital over 900 days and 18 wow. years. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely horrible. My wife, my wife's life is horrible. It still is not okay after all these years. What, why I bring this up because of what you're saying here, I would take her, to the emergency room, I would take her to the admissions office at University Hospital so many times, even the very next day, and they would say, and what is your address, where do you live? And we would say, we live in Harrison, and they say, well, I have your address at Luther Lane in Cleves. And we were just there the day before. before. We had the admissions people, I don't know how many times this was, probably 20, 30, 40 times in the course of months to five, we don't live in Cleves. We live in Harrison, and they always had it wrong. I think that's where the beginning of it all was, but it got much worse because this whole thing where you send statements or you have somebody calling, nothing like that happened. I paid thousands of dollars. I cashed in all of my investments, all my stocks, everything I had to pay all of the medical bills. And this is in the very beginning, the right. first year. There were so many bills that had to be paid. Of course, as you probably know, on an early Sunday morning, a collection agency called because they know you're going to be at home. This is a whole new experience for me. And they say, Mr. Gilman, you owe $200 and you have not paid this. Only $200. And I had paid pay my entire life savings and all of my investments were cash. I paid thousands of dollars. And this was only for a measly $200, and I gave the credit card number, and I paid for this, and they ruined my credit. And this is where this is great that I can have this human contact with really wonderful people that are here tonight. So if you hear something like this in your hospital of somebody like me that ha this has had mm -hmm. what happened to me, I talked to those people so many times. My wife, who was terribly sick, called so many times, and. I kept saying, I need to speak to a supervisor like one of you. Right. That's what I use, supervisor, even though that's not your, your title exactly. And I said, I need to talk to somebody right. about this. Yep. My credit is ruined. We moved, and this bill was sent to the wrong, wrong house address. Or yep. It was never sent at all. Something, it was only $200. Right. Look at all the history of all the money I have sent the university hospital. I pay the bills. I didn't get this bill, and look what happened to me. And right. finally, some really nice person, a supervisor, stepped in and took care of it. And whatever she did, she corrected our credit mm -hmm. because 
I owed so much money, like I said, 900 days of a hospital, yeah, yeah. intensive care, emergency room visits in the middle of the night. I could, I, one of my things I was going to do, I was going to refinance the house and take all the equity out oh, of the house, yeah. but my credit was ruined. They're not going to let me refinance because I am a very bad risk. Mm -hmm. And I just say this because you can just understand maybe what happens to people. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm a teacher. My wife is a nurse. We have good jobs and good income mm -hmm. before all this thought happened, you know. Right. And, you know, it, it was just a horrible, horrible experience. Thing. Yeah. So when people ask for your help, yeah. you can think of me. Absolutely. It is just. And we, obviously, terrible, I'm terrible so sorry to hear that. Yep. I'm so sorry to hear that was your experience. And I think that's absolutely the point. I mean, all, all of us in this room from TriHealth, and we all talk to patients just like yourself. And obviously, we always hope. It doesn't have to get escalated to us, but that's what we're here for. And absolutely, when we hear these, it's like, oh my goodness, what can we do? Obviously, you know, hopefully we'll apologize, but it's, it's about learning where did we drop the ball? Like, how did this happen? So we can try to prevent it, obviously, for the next patient and fix the system. So to this point, we are reaching out, we are making contact, we're making phone calls. Um, so, you know, please don't take them as harassing phone calls. They're really meant to make sure you did get your statement. Um, because again, you know, data entry mistakes can happen, um, and we want to catch them as soon as possible to make sure you can continue to get your statements and engage with us. Um, this is just really quick as I as I lead into the last couple slides here. Um, and again, this is sad, but this is how much of uh, the financial experience is impacting the overall patient experience. So, uh, New England uh, Journal of Medicine basically says, you know, a third of Americans don't trust the healthcare system because of the fear with the rising costs of, of health care, right? Um, and so what we're seeing, and again, how the system is evolving, is the, we're changing the way the system is going to be paid, right? And it's going to encompass the quality outcomes and the patient experience as part of that variable. Um, so to, to add a little more color to this, so again, this is my key takeaway here. Engage with us. Please don't let your fear um, stop you from calling us. We want to work with you. Um, there's lots, and this isn't even necessarily a, an exhaustive list. So what our financial counselors do is we engage with you and we do a financial screening. Um, we have our financial assistance applications are on the back of our statements. So we're trying to be as transparent as possible. You can go onto our website and get the application. Um, and then we have financial counselors that actually report up through Rita's area and they will either call you by phone, they can meet you in person, and they will collect your, your financial history and income. And then they're going to look, because they're our experts, right? They know, based on looking at that, if you will, because it, it is you know, based on eligibility, what you might qualify for from a financial assistance perspective. So some people might be eligible for Medicaid. Um, you might be eligible for HCAP, which is a, an Ohio care assurance program that hospitals pay into. And again, it's going to be for your lower income patients that would be eligible. Then we have, you know, charity care. So again, based on federal poverty levels, um, you know, we have a charity care policy that people may or may not qualify for. And then, you know, kind of as a last case resort, if you don't qualify for any of those things, we also offer payment plans. And I just talked to you about, you know, in most cases, we can go up to 18 months kind of on that first pass. But if you have larger bills, um, we can go even further than 18 months um, with our care payment option. Um, so again, I have to put the plug in. So you've heard how complicated the system is. So obviously, those of you that are able to pay timely, do pay timely. We really do appreciate that. Um, it does save a lot of extra administrative work on the back end when that happens. So again, I can't, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank you um, if you're able to do so. Um, and I think my last slide, um, just a couple of things that we're working on. Um, and again, I love the feedback and the suggestion from the gentleman in the back about, you know, how can we potentially... Uh, you know, inform you all if an authorization is on file. So we're always working to expand our MyChart um, functionality. Again, we want to get to the point where you know we are easy to use. Um, and again, I don't I don't want to make assumptions. I don't know how many of you use your mobile phones. Um, I know I use my phone a lot. Um, anything I can do very quickly with a couple clicks or pay a bill, I love. Um, but whether you want to do that in my chart or if you like paper or you like calling and you pay in by phone, all of those options, you know, we try to be as, as flexible as possible. Um, as I shared a little bit earlier, we are working to launch our patient estimates 
Um, so again, uh, we think that'll be a very uh, well-received program um, to really inform you as a patient so you know prior to having your service what your out estimated out-of-pocket's gonna be, um, and then you can make a decision um, as to whether or not you wanna proceed with the test. Um, and or prepare, you know, or plan better, if you will. Um, better customer service. So again, a lot of us in the, the RevCycle leadership team are relatively new to TriHealth, and our goal is to constantly improve, right? Um, so we're always learning from experiences, from patient calls, you know, where did we mess up? How can we fix it? You know, what was the root cause? Um, and that's our goal. Um, I already talked about mobile options. Um, we talked about this, Jason hit on, hit on this. We are working to become a high reliable organization. Um, because we want to have you have an exceptional experience and it, most importantly not experience any harm um, that could have been prevented um, and then again service recovery as I said it before I wish I could tell you we're perfect we are not um, but we absolutely care wholeheartedly about you all um, and if we mess up you know we will own it and we will work to make it right I know, I know that was a lot of information in my time. I know. I'm worn out, right? Um, I hope this was helpful. Any other last minute questions? I appreciated the dialogue. Yes, Ethan. Okay, are we out of time? Well, I mean, right. just in general, I mean, I guess, you know, a few years ago when Obamacare was just rolling out, I went to a lecture by Ezekiel Emanuel trying to promote Obamacare. And he talked about value based mm -hmm. medicine and all this stuff. And, and years later, you know, we. We see Obamacare's, I don't know, a lot of people just hate it. I mean, it certainly raised our premiums like crazy. But um, I guess the point is, I'm trying to understand what are your incentives? What, you know, I mean, I come from a country, Israel, mm -hmm. where there's universal health coverage. Right, yeah. My mom spent, I don't know, weeks and weeks in the hospital, never got a bill. Mm -hmm. It was done. Okay, and here we have to deal with all these complications. I don't understand mm -hmm. how in the 21st century we can have such a complicated an inefficient system that cost three trillion, trillion dollars. dollars right. Okay, and uh, so I think that in general, uh, it's very confounding. Mm -hmm. um, but what are your incentives really to get better? How? Because you are, after all, a for-profit organization. Yes. Nope. No? We're, We're non-profit. Well, but you have to at least. Right. Meet so the any goals. margin we make goes back into the investments of the facilities, okay. the machines, so and stuff talk like that. A little yeah. bit about that. Mm -hmm. What are the incentives really yep. for improving the efficiency of the system? Yeah, so I kind of hit on this a little bit earlier, but kind of really quickly to, to recap. Because the, the country of the United States, we obviously don't have the system um, Israel has because we have multi-payers yeah. um, in the mix um, because Americans like choice, right? Um, so that in and of itself complicates the system. But the way that the system is evolving is they're going to not just pay us simply because we provided the service. If we don't hit certain patient experience scores, so when Jason asked you all how many of you have filled out a patient experience score, you know, our scores are going to have to be at certain levels as just one element for Medicare to pay us. And in some cases, if they don't hit certain levels, they're actually going to penalize us. So is Medicare the organization that yes. kind of yeah. monitors? Yeah. They're the big cheese. Yes. yes. Yep. And then all the other payers, all the other insurance they companies. Follow suit. They typically follow suit. Yeah. Yep. yep. So Medicare, so the Centers for Medicaid, so CMS, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, yeah. kind of like set the precedent. And then typically the commercial payers will follow suit, to Jason's point. Um, so we know it's coming in more robustly down the pike for the, the system, if you will. But Medicare is starting, has already started this process. Um, so like I said, we are working hard to improve our patient experience. We are engaged to become a highly reliable organization. So we're working with companies that have specialized in the airline industry. And you talk about safety and building processes that are fail safe and fail proof. Um, because again, there's nothing more important at the end of this equation than the human and the patient that is you know, receiving this care. So, and then when we start to do all of that, we don't make as many mistakes. We don't have to spend all of our time, you know, making hours and hours of phone calls to insurance companies because we start to prove our value. We start to change the rules. I, I shared the good news about Anthem because we're already demonstrating the progress. Anthem's actually entertaining a program they're going to call Green Pass, where they're going to start to relax some of the pre-certification rules for us. And the onus is on us, kind of think about it, and I don't want to go down a whole other path, about a capitated model where 
you know, we get a certain amount of money and we have to manage you and we have to keep you well and keep you out of the hospital. Oh, that's the European model. Yeah. So Medicare is driving this. Correct. Essentially. You're being yes. driven by Medicare. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. But at the end of the day, yeah. what's really important is that if we're not competitive, we die. Yeah. As a health system, as a hospital. Yeah. The most important thing to take away is everyone has a choice. Right. And you look at the systems that are in the city, we were all competing for the same patients right. at, at the end of the day. Right. And if we don't perform well, you'll go somewhere else. Right. And so we have to up our game. And you see that throughout the city. You're seeing new buildings, new services, <laughs> new marketing. Mm -hmm. right. And it's because everyone is competing for the same, the same patients. Right. But, but the important thing is, if you go, if you come to us and you have terrible care or terrible experience, you're not going to come back. And if you have that throughout the community, all of a sudden we cease to exist. So along with the oversight of CMS to make sure that we are caring for the community and for population health, we also have an interest as a business, a viable business, that in order for us to sustain ourselves, we've got to up our game. Mm -hmm. And that's the transition and the transformation that all the health systems are going through now. You go into any hospital now and, and you go into a patient room, you have people who talk to you, your nurses talk to you, they're nice, the doctors are nice to you most of the time. <laughs> Whereas 10 years ago, the doctor came in, did what he needed to do, wouldn't answer any questions, walked out, even the nurses a lot of times. But patient experience means everything anymore because you have a voice. And so, you know, another thing real quickly with, with the whole issue on the bills. Every health system wants to uh, provide you with service and make sure that you take care of your bills. If you get to a point, that, and this is, this is something that I know because I've been in the industry a long time. If you continue to escalate and not get anybody who wants to hear from you and won't help you, that's your supervisor, 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 over and over again. Greatest thing that you can do, I probably shouldn't tell you this, but I'm going to tell you it anyway. Write a letter to the CEO. Yeah. <laughs> that gets someone's attention within the organization. Now, again, this is a last resort. <laughs> but um, And at TriHealth, I would ask that you come to Doug or myself. <laughs> Actually, yeah. Nancy, Doug, or myself, I'll right? Myself. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. yeah. but, but, yeah. we do care and we will listen. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people just get frustrated and they give up. Right. And, right. and the reality is you just haven't found the right person in the organization who gets it and who understands, hey, we're dealing with people, we're dealing with their lives, their livelihood, their health. And there's a ton of people in that organization who do get it. You just maybe have not gotten the right person. Can I have just a small caveat on that? Hmm? If you get your care at Triumph, I brought my business card. Yes. I am yeah. more than willing to take your call. I work cases myself. Mm -hmm. So I am not a manager that says I don't want to be involved. I, I keep an active caseload, an active roster. I have a cell phone that's on 24 hours a day, and I tell people you can call me any time of the day. I talk to people after their cases are done because if you don't get perfect care from us, then I'm not doing my job, my team's not doing their job, or we as a system aren't doing our job. So please. Feel free. I will give all of you my business card if you want, because it, it's that important to us that we get it right. And, and don't take me wrong. I'm, I'm going to do the same thing. You can call me directly. I don't have enough business card, but we'll, we'll get you the information. This is just one of these things, and it's not necessarily try help thing, because obviously you've got people here who can't, and we have a number of players within the organization. We're going to take care of you. Yeah. Outside of try help, to that that point, that as that point, point, you can go if you're not being heard. Yeah. yeah. Did you? I know we're. Wrap it. Do you have one last question here? So we'll wrap up, wrapping up here. Yeah. We're all competing for this business, you would say. But uh, I find that kind of hard to, to rationalize with when they say all the time there is a shortage of doctors. There is. So there is. If there is, then yeah. what's the competition? I don't get it. Yeah, so, I mean, at the end of the day, obviously, to Doug's point earlier, I mean, in theory, we'd all love for every single person in Cincinnati to come to try health, right? But there's only so much capacity, you know, because yeah. you have certain doctors that, you know, align. And so we talked about it earlier, part of that challenge is in certain specialties, it's an even bigger access problem. So, for example, neurology, 
dermatology. There's a shortage of those doctors nationally and then even locally. So when you only have a couple of doctors, you know, and you have a very large population that needs that service, you're unfortunately waiting for weeks or months or, you know, whatever to get in for an appointment. And that's unfortunate. That's what we as a health system are working to do is try to bring in new physicians, you know, make new relationships so that we can create better access um, so you can get in for your appointments faster and get answers um, to your, your issues. But it's not, again, it's not something that can be solved overnight because, as you know, it takes a long time to become a doctor. Um, but in, because of how crazy healthcare is, you know, there's been less people that want to be doctors and that want to be nurses because it's exhausting and it's hard work. Um, and the quality of life isn't always great, you know, because you work a lot. Um, but, you know, institutions are getting creative about how they get people in the, in the younger generations to want to go into healthcare to try to fix the shortage, you know, problem into the future, but it won't be solved overnight. So I wish I had a magic button. I don't. But. Thank you all so very much for allowing us to come. It was a pleasure to be here. Um, anything we can do to help, we're happy to serve. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very, very informative. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Let me know. Yeah, you obviously got my contact information. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Oh, I'm so happy.